You're watching PM Agenda. Time to bring in our panel of politicians. We're joined by Labor's Alana McTiernan and Liberal Senator Zed Seselja. Thank you both for joining us. Let's start with Arthur Sinodinus, um, Zed Seselja. In fact, you, you sat with him uh, in the chamber this afternoon after he stood down and went to the back bench. How's he holding up? Look, I think he's I think he's going well. I think Arthur's a very strong human being, a uh, person of a lot of integrity, and I, I'd prefer if he hadn't have joined me on the on the back bench. You mean uh, he should have he should today. have stayed on the front bench. Well, look, I think I think he's I think he's made the right decision, uh, but I think uh, there isn't actually any reason for him to step down other than the fact that uh, what is going on at the moment is is taking away from the government's agenda. And I think it's that's a, yeah. that's very much what's driven Arthur's decision. Which is what he said as well. But should that really be why someone stands down from? The ministry because it's a distraction. Surely you should only stand down if you've done something wrong. Well, these these are these are political considerations that have to be considered. The reality is is Arthur wants the government to do well. Uh, he believes that he will be vindicated, but. In the meantime, what we are likely to see is what we saw in the Senate this morning, which is the Labor Party joining with the Greens to frustrate the agenda, uh, to play these things out. Instead of mm. debating the carbon tax repeal or the mining tax repeal, uh, we were talking about this. So I think that would have been a, a, a big factor in, in Arthur's decision today. Alana McTiernan, you would have seen these similar sort of things at State Parliament and, and, and now in Federal Parliament. Um, well, no, and I think, quite frankly, we saw a lot of that over the last... Um, over the, over the last three years. I mean, yeah, I really yeah. do think that it is the height of hypocrisy to, uh, for the Liberal Party to be suggesting that these issues shouldn't be raised. I think Mr Senator Sinodinus has done the right thing standing down today. Although, uh, I, guess one, uh, I guess our question is the, the Prime Minister's judgement in um, appointing him to the position, because it's not as if this is new stuff. I mean, this was known about... It was known that he was, he was on the board of a company that had OB links. Yes, that and, and that there were very substantial amounts of money um, being paid by that company to the uh, to the Liberal Party, um, and and presumably he would have disclosed to the Prime Minister prior to his appointment uh, that he was all, also in in receipt of um, a very generous payment schedule um, from the uh, from the company. Well, so the, 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 I would the have salary you mean, or the, or the bonus that's now been revealed that he stood to gain if this deal went through? Well, well even the salary itself. Itself, which you know um, it comes in at around two thousand dollars an hour, so it's uh, <laughs> a not you think you know, should have for a government that's talking about cutting out penalty rates. It's not an inconsiderable well, <laughs> payment of money. You think he should have told the prime minister that what he was earning in the in the, in the private? Well, sector? I presume that given the controversy around this, that he would have made this disclosure. I mean, I think a man uh, of San Senator Sinodinus' character, one would presume that he would have discussed very openly and frankly with the prime minister. This was around. I mean, not the detail we have now, but this was around. Surely there would have been some discussion about it. Well, well, look, there may well have been, but I'll, I'll go to the point here. We're seeing more of what we saw this morning, which is the attempts to smear uh, through innuendo rather than through no. specifics. Well, let, let, let's go through what happened today in the Senate. Uh, there was a lot of smear and innuendo from members of the Labor Party. John Faulkner, though, said it well when he said he was not making a claim that Arthur Sinodinus had acted uh, inappropriately or corruptly, and in fact, there are no specific allegations. No, no they're not. But, and, but and nor, nor am I Arthur, making Arthur that. Sinodinus. But I'm saying Senator, that you, you've just said he stood down because this was a, a bad look. It was distracting, you know, the agenda. Indeed. So, to the point, shouldn't this political consideration have been given before putting him into the ministry? That at some point, this is going to be a distraction. Well, look, I think it's hard to it's hard to judge these things ahead of time. But in the end, um, Arthur Sinodinus was appointed to the ministry because he's an outstanding contributor to the coalition. And I don't think there's anyone uh, in, across the aisle in the federal parliament who doesn't believe that Arthur Sinodinus is capable and competent uh, enough to be a senior minister within the coalition government. And that's why he was appointed. And, and look, people, I, I, I think we accept that, but we just think that, given the nature of these uh, of the the inquiry and the the quite right public concern about there being um, a taxpayers being um, potentially ripped off in this process or certainly attempts uh, to rip them off very badly it, it seems to to us to be a very questionable decision to have made to put him into the ministry until all of that stuff was dealt with and um, and um, Senator Sen uh, Senator uh, was exonerated but if that indeed is what is going to happen. But again let's make it clear there are no allegations that have been made against Senator and I think that can get lost and I think the Labor Party has tried to 
have that no but there are facts there are facts that he was chairman of this organization he was chairman of this company not not just a you know there's nothing wrong in being chairman of an organization chairman of an association at a time when they were trying to massively rip off sydney water now i mean you can't i mean you you can't just paper over that that's actually that's actually a fact but again but again see this is this is where this this is where the guilt by association is coming in and we saw saw it uh, particularly uh, no, but interesting, on, but interesting, no, but interestingly enough... I mean, if you're a secretary the, the, the of a trade union, from, you've got responsibility. The Surely you're the a Labor chairman Part, of the company. The main charge from the Labor Party today was, was the guilt by association with Eddie Obeid, a Labor Party member. But put Eddie Obeid to one side. Um, th- this point, right, that as chairman of the company, surely you should know what the company's doing in, in pursuing probably their biggest contract of all time for this company. Well, obviously, those are, those are some of the things that will no doubt be canvassed. Uh, that is the point of having, ha- of having the inquiry. But and surely you should have known about big donations that company was making to the party, political party, which you are treasurer. Well, I don't, I don't know that that's the case. I, I don't think we can draw but that But, Lord, conclusion. well, what do you do? What well, do you do for your money? So if you don't know any... If you don't know what the company's doing... So you mean doing, I'm making the allegation you don't that he know. did know? No, I'm, I mean, I'm just saying, if, if, either way, it's problematic, isn't it? Because if you're a chairman of a company and you say, well, I don't know who are, who are the owners of the company, I don't know what the company is doing, I'm, I'm unaware of their activities, I'm not aware of what political parties uh, they're so, dealing with, I mean, what actually are you doing so as chairman? This, this is, this but I'm just where, saying it, yeah. it's got to be... Uh, we're what not saying it's what, you're saying, is, what you're saying is without having all the facts in front of you, you now want to litigate it, and that's what you were seeking no, to do in the no, Senate. Not that's at all. what you're seeking not, to not do publicly, no. is to litigate it here without all the facts. Uh, that's not how this process will go, and that's. Uh, he, I think we have the example. Well, I here do of seem why, to remember you wanting why, to mitigate many, of, many issues against Arthur many, many has, Labor has, people. Has chosen to, to do this because of the kind of behaviour we're seeing from the Labor Party. It is they do want to litigate it. Let, they wanted no, the Senate to be a start. Let me just finish this issue. Let me just finish this issue. Can the Liberals really complain about Labor pursuing when we saw how hard the then opposition went against? Yeah, various people. Julia Gillard, for example, in relation to activity that she had as a uh, as a as a lawyer. I mean, Julia Gillard you didn't step absolutely, down. I don't recall anyone calling you them to step absolutely down. Did went call, very did, hard. Did, did, but we're not. Look, all we're saying it is appropriate that because of the seriousness of the of the allegate of the matters that are being dealt with by uh, ICAC, mm-hmm. and because Senator Sinodinas at the time was the chairman of the committee, it is the right thing for him to stand aside. All we're saying is we just question the judgment of the Prime Minister in actually appointing him until such time that this matter had been resolved because it's right. been on the agenda re- for the last year. I don't recall anyone year. questioning his judgment when he was appointed to the ministry. I recall people saying, why wasn't why he wasn't in, he the in the cabinet? They didn't say he shouldn't, shouldn't We've got to move on. We, we need to take a break and, and get on to some of the other things, that have, uh, the actual policy issues that have been uh, discussed this week in Parliament. For our New Zealand viewers, though, New Zealand News is next for you. We'll continue with Zed Seselja and Alana McTiernan right after this. When you've got that afternoon hunger, it's time to head to Hungry Jack's. Because six golden chicken nuggets are now only $3. Six delicious chicken nuggets, now just $3. The burgers are better at Hungry Jack's. What really differentiates Saxo and the Saxo platforms is the fact that they are user-friendly platforms that we have multi-asset capabilities and that we have unique content that will allow people to make informed decisions about their trading. I know of no other platform like that in the world. Nobody likes you. Nobody wants you here. Go and give it to him. You're going to cry. Go give on, it. cry. <laughs> cry. Cry. <laughs> cry.
Have you been up all night? I'm looking for hotel deals. Why didn't you just go to hotels combined? They can be hundreds of travel sites in seconds. Hotels combined. Find the best price in seconds at hotelscombined.com. So I love these. Oh, <laughs> to stand tall, one must first stand comfortably. Mm. Good thing I bought new shoes. <laughs> now is the time to unleash your life force. Good thing I bought a Jeep. Watching PM Agenda. More from our panel in just a moment. First, a check of the news headlines. Here's Helen Daly. Thanks very much, David. Senator Arthur Sinodinas has stood aside as Federal Assistant Treasurer due to his links to a New South Wales corruption investigation. The Senator has been called as a witness at an ICAC inquiry into Australian water holdings, where he previously held a position on the board as chair. Prime Minister Abbott says Senator Sinodinas has done the right and decent thing. It comes after Labor and the Greens demanded an explanation over inconsistencies between a statement Senator Sinodinas gave to Parliament and evidence heard at the corruption probe. The Foreign Minister has announced Australia will impose financial sanctions against Russian and Ukrainian officials linked to Crimea's annexing by Russia. Julie Bishop condemned Russian President Vladimir Putin's move to annex the region and said the referendum in Crimea could not form any legitimate basis to allow it to secede and separate from the rest of Ukraine. Meanwhile, Ukraine has authorised its military to fire in self-defence after two soldiers were killed at a military base in Crimea, one from each side of the conflict. The wife of disgraced former Federal MP Craig Thompson has apologised on behalf of her husband in her character references tended to the Melbourne Magistrates Court. Zoe Thompson says her husband is sorry for the pain he's caused after being found guilty of dishonesty charges. The former union official misused his health services union credit cards to pay for escorts and other personal expenses during his time as National Secretary. Thompson will be sentenced next Tuesday. Three Australian soldiers have been injured during a live fire exercise in the Shoalwater Bay training area in Queensland. The ADF says the incident happened during the firing of an illumination round from an army howitzer. Any injury as serious as this could be life-threatening. Uh, however, we believe that they, uh, while they're critical, they're in a stable condition. It could have ended a lot worse, yes. Uh, in this instant, um, these guys have um, made it to hospital in one piece. The Defence Force Investigative Service is investigating the incident and will be liaising with the Queensland Police Service. The search for the missing Malaysian airliner has ended its 12th day as Australia continues to coordinate the search in the southern Indian Ocean. Eyewitness accounts have emerged with people claiming to have seen a low-flying jet with red stripes, similar to that of the missing plane, flying over their houses in the Maldives. It comes as Malaysian authorities are forced to defend accusations they're hiding information. In sport, the NRL has become the first Australian sport to begin testing players for the use of prescription drugs. It follows anecdotal evidence of the misuse of powerful drugs like Stilnox, chemicals found in other popular sleeping tablets and some strong painkillers have now joined party drugs and performance enhancers on the code's banned list. The code won't impose sanctions but will demand answers from players caught abusing the drugs as the NRL attempts to see just how widespread is the problem. David, that's it from the newsroom for the moment. Now it's back to you.
Helen, thank you very much. Uh, let's continue our conversation with Labor's Alana McTiernan and the Liberals' Zed Seselja. I want to turn to the Racial Discrimination Act. Uh, your party room yesterday discussed this and a number of your colleagues have concerns about the government's moves to repeal uh, section 18c of the racial discrimination act this is the section that makes it an offense uh, to quote offend insult humiliate or intimidate a person on racial or ethnic grounds uh, ken white has signaled he's prepared to cross the floor on this where, where do you stand on this well i support uh, the government's moves in this area obviously um, there's still a process to be gone through as to exactly what these changes will look like but i don't support people being dragged through the courts for um, saying things that other people would find offensive. I think that that is far too low a bar. Uh, I think that that does stifle freedom of speech. So that particular word, offend, I think is, offend is, and is too broad. Offend and insult is, is uh, it's, it's, I think it's too subjective um, and it's far too broad uh, in the end. I think that these laws were brought in particularly um, to avoid people inciting violence uh, and I think we, we want to see that continue to be protected. We don't want to see people intimidated uh, as a result of their race but I don't want to see people making a fair comment which some people find offensive being banned and I think that's that is the law as it stands. Does this stifle free speech do you think? Uh, uh, look I think um, the Senator's analysis is fundamentally wrong because within the law it is quite clearly an objective standard. It's not a question of whether you personally have have been offended or humiliated, but rather whether or not a reasonable person would be offended or humiliated. So it is not a subjective standard. It, it is a um, it is an objective standard. And quite but, frankly, but who decides that? I mean, the, the, the court, that's decided by the court. By, and there's many areas of law, and that's that the whole concept of what is, of what is reasonable is. You know that that is enshrined in our law in a whole raft of But why legislate things. against offence? I mean, that is that is the because, question. Because well, it's why well, I, I I just think that uh, a lot of people, including Ken White and lots certainly lots of Aboriginal people, really do think that if they are being humiliated, and if any reasonable person would believe that they were being humiliated on the basis of their their, their race, they want some. Um, m method of actually getting redress and I think that's an important thing in a civilised multicultural society that we have some measure, uh, some uh, avenue where people can get redress and can I just say look there's been only around I think about there's only been two cases that have actually gone to court um, through this provision. The overwhelming majority of these matters are indeed mediated and I think that is showing that this is a really good process where well, in a multicultural society you've got a mechanism where there can be a resolution of these One issues. One of those cases that did go to court was of course the, the case of Andrew Bolt in 2011. If that case had not gone to court, would we be even talking about this? Well, we, I think we may be. I think there's always been issues, but obviously that case highlighted uh, the law uh, and, and the reach of that law, and it's all well and good to say that not many cases go to court, but uh, there's a real chilling effect of a case like that. There is a real chilling effect of people being able to have debates. Uh, I don't believe Andrew, Bo Andrew Bolt is a racist, and, and I don't believe that he should have been uh, made out to be a racist and dragged through the courts. Now, I didn't agree uh, with what was in his article. I think some of it was a bit offensive and and I would not have written it but there's a difference between me between me not liking what someone says being offended by someone says and having a legal remedy and being dragged through the courts because of that offence and I think if we're going to protect freedom of speech we have to to some degree within reasonable limits protect people's freedom to say things which we really don't like. So where's this at now? Uh, is there further discussion in the party room to be held. Um, when, when are we going to see exactly what the government's going to do? Yeah, well, look, I think there's there's good there's good discussions that have gone on in party room, which I won't go into. But um, I, I think there is a process that George Brandis has been leading. Uh, there's been consultation, and I think very soon uh, we will see uh, what a reworked uh, 18C uh, would look like. And I think that much of the commentary has been in the absence of. The, the specifics uh, and I think once we see that I think perhaps some of the fears that some in multicultural communities have uh, may be allayed. Yeah, my, my understanding is that you're talking about deleting the words offend and humiliate uh, and I think on balance and you know there will be discussion about whether Andrew Bolt's case was uh, perhaps the 
the best resolution of that particular, you know, the best example of, of, of a decision under there. But we, are, we have got um, a big challenge in this country, and that is we have got people coming from all around the world. I think Australia does a pretty tremendous job, you know, compared to most places in, um, in uh, prosecuting the case for multiculturalism and getting people on side and behind it. But there does need to be, I think, I think it has worked well for us to have this legal remedy because overwhelmingly the legal remedy has resulted in people feeling that they have got some legitimate avenue um, when they have been uh, on any reasonable standard humiliated and that overwhelmingly these things are dealt with um, by way of uh, by by way of uh, reconciliation and mediation Look, and I think that's a and okay there's from time to time there might be a case or two that might be problematic but overwhelmingly I think it, the, the legislation is doing a good job you take that off and I think you, you're sending a message to people that we don't have to be careful about this I need, stuff. I need to, we need to move on to final issue uh, one of the red tape uh, areas the government's wanting to do away with uh, reforms Labor put in around financial advice uh, so getting rid of them which the government wants to do, we'll see, um, amongst other things, trailing commissions allowed from financial advisors, uh, essentially banks and other financial institutions allowed to sell all sorts of things uh, to, to customers. Uh, aren't some of these regulations giving consumers the safeguards they want? Well, remember, we're not getting rid of them. Uh, so these reforms, uh, they, they change uh, some of them and, and, and move some of what's been brought in. But many of the protections uh, and the most important protections will still be there. So financial advisors uh, giving personal advice uh, will still have to meet all of those areas of all, all of those um, tests within the legislation. What we will remove though is the vagary, I think it's of subsection G, I forget exactly, uh, which is sort of a, a catch-all and I think that catch-all becomes uh, very uncertain and that adds costs. You know, this is this is talking about reducing costs by about $190 million a year. But now. in this area, I mean, I, I get the idea of reducing cost on business. Great um, goal to have, but you've got to weigh that against the consumer, haven't you? And, and, in, indeed, and, and, and that's what this does, because remember, it keeps the vast bulk of these protections, mm. but what it does, things like things like opt, opt out, uh, that is a very costly way of doing it, when at the moment, and what will continue, is that uh, someone can at any time opt out. You can opt out at any time. It's just won't, there won't be this need uh, for a financial advisor to consistently be writing every couple of years and asking you to opt in. I think that is a very time-consuming way of doing it. It's a very costly way of doing it. And those costs get factored in and they get passed on to consumers. So this is about reducing cost to industry, reducing cost to consumers, whilst keeping those, those key protections. And, and look, there may, there may be some elements of the paperwork that could be improved. I mean, and I wouldn't argue that wouldn't be the case. But, I mean, my understanding here is that the fundamental backtracking is on this whole notion of financial planners being allowed to be paid commissions. I mean, that is a, that is a very, very um, significant move in, in, un, in unravelling the protections. But, but, of course, that's only where where a consumer chooses that. I mean, that's that's the thing here. You know, it is about giving consumers choice, and consumers may well choose not to have a lot of upfront fees and pay commissions, particularly if they feel a financial advisor is going to give them a very good product as a result of that. If there's an incentive for that financial advisor that's greater than the ordinary but, but incentive, what, what? so we shouldn't we shouldn't what? believe that consumers are stupid. We shouldn't plans? believe that people don't try and act in their own best interest when they're dealing with their financial planners, and that's that's where we're trying to rebalance it. It's saying yes, you need certain protection. Yes, yeah. they will be there, but choice needs to be there as well. And that, that helps the Financial costs. Planners Association themselves are very concerned about that because a lot of people that do go to financial planners are not financially sophisticated, which is the reason why they are going. Which is why so many of those protections planners. will continue to be there. Right. Uh, we'll uh, have to wrap it up, I'm afraid. We're running out of time. But uh, interesting discussion on a few fronts there, Alana McTiernan and the Zed Zeselge. Good to talk to both of you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks very much.